I'm good. Should I start over? No. <laughs> Do you want to? I mean, it was so good, right? You want me to start over? Okay. Um, the specific internship or engagement opportunity available today will be defined by the scientific founders who present to you tonight, the people that you're going to meet. We've asked our presenters to describe the programs that they're hoping to participate in and the skills they're looking for from new team members. And to be clear, they're not looking for co-founders right now. They're seeking talented, smart, collaborative team members to work alongside them for the purpose of learning and exploring opportunities. That said, many Chicago Booth students before you have participated as interns or business leads for projects, much like the ones you're gonna hear about tonight. And for some, it has created transformational career opportunities. And for others, this has been a place where they get to meet co-founders and go on to launch a deep tech venture. So you never know what might happen. We're grateful that you've dedicated your time to join us this evening. And I think you'll be inspired and excited to build upon the relationships that you make. Okay, I wanna talk about the logistics of how things are gonna to roll tonight. In a moment, you'll hear seven five minute pitches from several of the university's top researchers and scientists. For those of you who are here in person, after the pitches, we'll open up the room for networking. Those of you who are here will have a chance to introduce yourself, ask questions and learn more from the folks who are presenting. If you are here with us in the room, we encourage you to meet with the presenters at their designated tables following the pitches. Each table is assigned with the team name as well as a QR code. If you're interested in speaking further with the team after the networking time, this evening, or determine you want to work together, please scan the QR code and complete the short form. Similar to our virtual attendees, the Polsky team will be sending out an email tomorrow to follow up so that you can continue the conversation. For those of you who are joining via the live stream, there's a gallery on the live stream webpage highlighting the teams presenting this evening. If you would like to connect with one of the presenters, and discuss ways to support their project, please use the connect button, button in the gallery. This will bring you to a form where you can share your contact info and select the team or teams you're interested in connecting with. Again, the Polsky team will then use that form and email you with introductions tomorrow. And if you have any questions about the Polsky Center, about entrepreneurship, innovation, the programs that we offer, Find one of us tonight, send an email, stop by the center, uh, call me anytime. Uh, we really do genuinely wanna speak with you. We're excited to support your career aspirations and your entrepreneurial journey. Okay, enough of that. I'm ready for the first presenter and I'm assuming the first presenter is ready for me, Professor Banzai Tian of Scilight. Welcome. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bo Jutian. I'm a professor in the chemistry department. This is my very talented graduate student, Alexander Preminsky. So today we're here to present a very exciting platform for biological modulation, such as the control of the brain or heart activities. We call our platform C-Light. SI stands for silicon, which is a crucial semiconductor that we use daily and we can easily find silicon in our cell phone or computer. Light is a wireless source of energy that we input into the silicon in order to avoid the use of bulky electrodes or battery. So where can we use our platform? Well, there are numerous places for potential applications, such as designing biomedical implants, creating a artificial tissue or organ, or even healing the wounds 
caused by diabetes. If we look into the traditional biomedical implants, such as the cardiac pacemaker or deep brain stimulators, those devices are rigid, bulky, invasive, and oftentimes they need some additional surgery to remove the devices after their jobs are done. So our approach to those health issues is different. We use a so-called photovoltaic effect in a way that is similar to how we convert the energy of light into electricity using a solar panel. But the difference here is that we're using ultra small and ultra light solar panels for biological applications. Additionally, our device is soft and flexible and you can wrap the device around the organ surface for minimally invasive biointerface. So now let me just show you two videos so that you can understand how our device platform work. In this first video, we use pulse light and we shine light on the surface of an isolated heart. As you can see, when the light hits the heart surface, the beating rate of the heart immediately increased. And as we use a piece of paper to block the light, the heart beating rate immediately went back to its original state. In this second video, we also used pulse light, but in this case, we used the pulse light to control the limb motion of a mouse that was put to anesthesia using a drug. So as I mentioned earlier, the traditional devices are bulky and rigid, but they have been used for centuries because they're non-genetic, so they can be easily translated. There is a second class of technology also used for biological modulation, and this is called optogenetics, which involves the use of light and also genetically engineered proteins. This technology involves genetic modification. So currently, it's still pretty challenging to apply to certain cases in terms of translational or clinical application because there are ethical hurdles. Our approach combines the advantages of those current two methods that is being non-genetic, such as the electro-based method, and also the use of the light as practiced in optogenetics. Our platform overlaps with two existing market domains. The first one is called electroceuticals or electro-stimulation-based therapy. This table shows the global market with projected and current numbers in million US dollars. And as you can see, by 2027, the total global market should exceed 50 billion US dollars. The second market domain is so-called biophotonic systems. And the current market is around 100 million US dollars. And in about two years, that number should exceed 200 million US dollars. So before we can commercial our platform, there's still a long way to go. And right now we're here, we have developed our platform we have collected preliminary results, we fire the patents, and we hope that through this iCorps program, we can have a jump start for our startup in about one year. And our team currently just contains me and also my student, Alexander Premisky. And what we're looking for are those business uh, oriented thinkers who can help us approach those final goals step by step. So with this, I would like to finish my page. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we are moving on to Dr. Stefan Udenberg of InnoFaith, who I have to say, it's very exciting to me because this is the first um, booth collaboratory and participant in the history of the program. No pressure. <laughs> Welcome. It's up to you. Hello, can you hear me? Excellent. Uh, welcome. My name is Stefan Udenberg. I am a postdoc here at Booth. 
Uh, and today I'm going to tell you about a very nascent project business-wise, but one that's more developed scientifically. Um, it's called Interface, and it's kind of a play on words. It's meant to be in no face, and you'll see what I mean shortly. The idea is that we need someone to come along from you guys, hopefully, and build out the sort of business side of our, of our team, because we have a lot of technical and scientific firepower, but not as much on the business side. You'll see what I mean shortly. So I'd like to start by having you engage in an exercise of visual imagery. This is just some transformations of faces. But imagine for a moment that you just moved. You just moved to a new state or a new country, and you're trying to get your driver's license switched over. You're at the DMV. But the forms are confusing. You're not sure what to do. These are the only two clerks available. So who would you rather ask for help? If you're anything like the participants in our studies, you may find yourself drawn more towards the woman on the left because she's just more friendly, more trustworthy looking perhaps. Because when you look at a face, you can't help but read it. Faces have all kinds of information on them. They communicate how we feel about people as via emotional expression. They communicate our age as via the lines and creases on our faces. But you also can't help but read into a face as when you gain vivid impressions of how trustworthy someone looks or how competent you think they look or what have you. And these kinds of impressions, these latter kinds of impressions are often wildly inaccurate, but they matter. They matter a great deal to people's outcomes as in sentencing decisions in criminal justice contexts, as in purchasing decisions, as in hiring decisions. So as a result, the group that I work with has been doing this for the past 10 years, trying to suss out what it is that we see in faces. What is it about faces that is driving these kinds of judgments? So this is a data-driven model circa 2008, um, which up until very recently was the state of the art that's going to take you through what people think trustworthiness looks like. This is not what trustworthiness actually is. It's just what people think. So we're going to go more and more and more trustworthy. You'll notice a lot of things change about the face. The face becomes more feminine, more smiley. Um, and then we're going to go back down towards the average and towards untrustworthiness, where it looks more masculine, more scowly. Um, and they, they tend to evoke very vivid impressions. The issue here, as you may be able to tell, is that these are all bald heads on black backgrounds of Caucasian faces. They're not very convincing. So they're great for stimuli and psychology experiments, at least some of them, where you don't need to convince people that these are real people. But the goal of my postdoc was to sort of bring these models up into the modern day. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a face that has been made to look very quote unquote untrustworthy. And we're going to make him look more and more trustworthy in a sec. Assuming he'd like to transform. There we go. Um, a lot of things change. He smiles more. His background becomes more colorful. And uh, he becomes less scowly. In other transformations, you'll also see that the direction of his gaze matters. He looks more at the camera when he's more trustworthy. And this is all to say, this, this is a bit of a surprise, but none of the faces that you've seen so far are real. They're using deep learning technologies to, to make this stuff. These are some more examples of the kinds of things that we can do. We can do this for any trait you could think of. So any word that you can use to describe someone, we can make a model of that. We've done it for about 34 words so far. This right here, for example, is a model of a memorableness, what people think memorableness looks like. The faces become more ethnic and feminine and made up and smiley. Um, this is all made using a prototype that I made, which is currently in production at MindWorks. If you've been to Boots' new Museum of Behavioral Science in downtown Chicago, if you haven't, it's free. I highly recommend it. Uh, however, the, the photo booth where you can learn about the science of first impressions and like is currently down due to the COVID mask mandate. But when that returns, please stop by. Um, this was all accomplished with funding via Princeton. We filed the patent. It's pending right now. And what we're looking for is people to help us figure out non-dystopian and viable and good ethical use cases for this, because I could think of lots of dystopian ways to use this, but I don't want to be unleashed. Um, so we're looking for positive social impacts out of this. Uh, this is a very unique sort of technology. There's nothing else out there that I think that not only does generation of faces or transformation of faces, but also inference of faces. So I can take a picture of you and I can tell you what on average the population will think about your face, for example. And so we've already developed this for academic purposes, and it'll, it'll be very useful to people studying this kind of stuff, but it'd be nice to know what we need to develop this out for a business use case. Um, our team has a lot of technical firepower. Alex is the leading, he's the professor on this. He's the leading guy on face impressions. Um, our team at Princeton and at Stevens is amazing. 
And uh, yeah, I just like to say, please come join us. It'll be fun. Um, very nascent project. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Uh, now we've got Daniel, uh, Professor Daniel Fabricki of Personal Tumor Model. Oh, there you are. Wonderful, welcome. Hi everyone, I'm Dan Fabrique from the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. And uh, my idea is about personal tumor models. It's not stemming from my research, it's stemming from my personal experience. Um, and after that last talk, I better show you my face. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> How do I score? Okay, so about a million Americans a year will be told that um, they have cancer and um, they have a cancerous tumor inside of them. So imagine being one of those people and you're told by a doctor that you need to go through an MRI or a CAT scan, and then you're sat down in front of a computer and you're shown the results. He shows you a slice through your chest, chest cavity, say, um, and then goes step-by-step step through slices and shows you the 3D, um, 3D structure of your tumor. Even if you're better at visualizing in 3D than most people, um, this is kind of impersonal and hard to take in as you've heard this bad news. Um, and moreover, you're not really sure as you leave that day whether you'll be able to retain it and whether you'll be able to explain your condition to your family. So, um, and when treatment is discussed, how are you supposed to um, compare that to what images you saw? So the project idea is to um, go along the, the lines of personal medication. So personalized medicine is an expanding field where the particular problem in each individual's case is um, subjected to treatment. Um, so we wanna make full, a full, give a full understanding of CT or MRI scan data to the patient. Um, so this is coming from my personal experience because I was sat down in front of uh, the screen to see my mother's tumor and um, it was big and severe. And in fact, she died several uh, months later, just last year. Um, but I was wondering how I would communicate the severity of that to my family. And I asked the doctor, um, can I order a 3D printing of that tumor? And he said, no, I don't know any company that does that. So um, that's why I'm here to try to explore starting such a company. Um, so it is quite feasible technologically. 3D printing is getting cheaper and more widespread. And also uh, the task of segmentation that is taking the, the CT scan and defining the 3D region of the tumor. Um, when a doctor orders it, a, a trained radiologist can take about two hours and do this job. But with artificial intelligence and deep learning, like you just heard about, um, this can be made into a program that can be run on a data set. It doesn't require uh, so much, so much um, attention. So here's an example of the slices being built into a 3D model and then into a rendering. And um, <clears throat> that can be sliced up into by a computer and put on a on a scanner. So thanks to um, Jane and Elizabeth at the Polsky Center's Fab Lab uh, for allowing me to make this prototype. So you can see that at the table afterwards. So with this technology, um, it's been used already for doctors and radiologists for training purposes. But again, um, an individual doesn't just go off and request their own tumor. So the idea is to figure out how how to enter this space and have doctors communicate to patients about their condition. Um, for patients, it will allow them to take ownership of the process so that they can be informed and motivated to do the treatment. Um, for instance, they might need to know why they need to do chemo. They might want to 
uh, make different models of different scans over several months to see if the tumor is still growing or whether it's shrinking under treatment and maybe uh, decide whether to do an operation. Um, now for post-treatment survivors, they might want to use these models either to remember or to forget um, in the sense to remember somebody might have the temperament who wants to keep it as a trophy uh, or there might be someone else who wants to get together their family and friends and destroy the thing. Um, to put it behind them. So right now, the participation is a graduate student in medical imaging who's um, partnering with me on the technical side of making models. And the needs for this business are, I'm entering the i program to identify customers, and then I need people who are, uh, know how to develop a business, um, the ins and outs of medical insurance, and how to pitch it so that um, medical insurance will want to cover it and also legal compliance, how to move this data back and forth without uh, breaking privacy concerns. So meet me over at the table and I'll, we'll talk about how you can participate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next presenters are Daniel Grazenda, a staff data scientist and Guillermo Martins, a senior software engineer presenting on Open Data Platform on behalf of the Data Science Initiative team. Welcome. Hi everyone, I'm Daniel Grizenda and I'm here with Guillermo Martins and we're gonna tell you about a project we've been working on for the last year at the data science initiative called the Open Data Platform. Uh, so data has never been more popular probably, um, but we're learning more and more that data, um, data doesn't scale the same way traditional software does. Instead, the value of data is actually in the individual use case. Um, and we learned that through doing analyses on the data and uh, gaining insights from those analyses. But though, when we start um, processing a data set, we quickly find that um, there's a lot of upfront cost, whether it's customer specific or data specific, whether it's data cleaning or um, how we impute the data, there's a lot of upfront cost. And without being able to share and reproduce and collaborate on these analyses, we're gonna lose a lot of value. And so we're building a platform to make transparent data analysis easy and shareable. So if our goal is to unlock the value in collaboration through uh, data, then we really have two big problems we're trying to solve. The first is that these analyses aren't easily reproducible. There's a lot of um, technical uh, hardware and software that goes into um, starting a data science project. And then the second project is that data has gravity. So it's hard to move. When you get terabytes of data, um, it's either uh, very expensive or takes a long time to move it. So the idea of open data is hard when you, when you can't actually share that data. Thank you. <laughs> so these are four pillars of the uh, open data platform. We've talked a little bit about reproducibility and data access. Um, the other two are education. Uh, we think a platform like this would be great for uh, teaching the next generation of data scientists and also developing a community, a platform around data where both technical and non-technical users can kind of collaborate on what needs to be done in data science. Okay, let me jump in with a few technical uh, details of the platform. In terms of usability, of course, we wanted to, to uh, uh, develop this platform as easy as possible to use. Um, with just a few steps, we expect you to run a full data analysis. Um, and for example, um, step number one, you can select your project from, a, from our catalog. Step number two, that's where the magic happens. When you hit play, our platform is responsible to allocate all the resources necessary to run your data analysis back to back in the cloud without the need for any complex package installation. Step number three, you can always collaborate. You can always extend existing projects that's, that has been hosted on our platform. Step number, number four, uh, you can always save and share. 
we are building this platform on top of very exciting uh, technologies like Binary Hub, Kubernetes, Docker, and React. In terms of mar markets um, and a little bit of context here, um, we do have experience on education, as you can probably tell. And uh, we also have key partners already established on, on nonprofits. But we think there is we think that there is more to this, and uh, that's where we believe we might need your help um, to figure out some of these questions. For example, um, uh, do the idea uh, does does the idea of reproducibility align with the uh, with the need to produce more transparent media articles? For example, could that be an application for the media? Um, so that 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 is one question that would we would like to to have help. In terms of roadmap, uh, we are still working on a prototype. And yes, we have a longer uh, list of features ahead of us. And uh, we're excited to, to explore different kinds of applications for, for this platform. Now, back to. Yeah, so this is our team. Um, we have five software engineers or data scientists working at the Data Science Institute. Um, but who we're looking for, you, uh, we're about to get started with i -Corps. And we're interested in someone who's interested in business development for a data product, um, a non interested in nonprofit outreach is a plus. Uh, and then we're hoping to do kind of a market analysis. We're thinking media is the next opportunity, but we'd love to hear from you if you think something different. Um, and then we can see you later at our table, or if you're online, here are our emails and you can feel free to reach out. Thank you. Our next presenter is Gustavo Andreas Vasquez Montoya. He's a PhD candidate in molecular engineering. He's presenting Soundflow. Welcome. Hey, hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gustavo. Uh, today I'm very excited to talk with you at uh, this interesting opportunity. It's a startup that we call Soundflow that aims to create a new generation of optical displays. So displays are important because we see them in our everyday lives. Of course, humanity, really we can say that we understand the world through our eyes and we're constantly trying to build new ways to create and experience images. We see it in, 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 our, in our lives, in our TVs, in our computers. We use them for work or for entertainment. We see displays in the screens, in advertising. We see it in medical displays for diagnosis. People use it for transportation, in panels. People use it for military purposes. And it's really, the list goes on and on on applications. So I want to... Okay, so briefly high, highlight uh, key components of how the te this technology works. So the way we make images in a display is to put important pieces together. We have a source of light, as you can see in number one. We have an electronic circuit, as you can see in number three. We have a set of filters and polarizers to better control the light. And we have a medium, usually a liquid crystal that we can use to control how much light passes through a specific spot. So this is like the key components. And this medium is very important because we can apply an electric field to change the molecular orientation of the liquid crystal. And by using that, as you can see in, in the right, changing that orientation allows us to control how much light passes through. This is the backbone of liquid crystal displays. My colleague, Dr. Emersik, that is here with me and I, we have found, uh, we discovered an exciting and new way to control liquor crystals, incorporating not only an electric field, but also applying uh, acoustic field and fluid flow. Combining these three, we open a new, a new 
opportunities, total new ways of controlling how these liquid crystals work, how can we manipulate them, and then how can we control how light passes through these displays. So effectively, with this new technology, we can create uh, displays in a way that was never thought possible before. And with, with our ideas, we believe that we can push the boundaries of what is possible in this place. And a good way to make to visualize this is to make a classical comparison between liquid crystal displays and its traditional competitor, LEDs. So as you can see from the table, LEDs are usually slightly better in terms of resolution, update speed, and contrast ratio, but they have lower lifetimes and also they're significantly more expensive than liquid crystals. Resolution is very important because the more pixels you have, the sharper the image that you can produce. In this case, the better you can see the bear. Update speed is critical when you need a real time response and you constantly need the most up-to-date information in your screen, which is critical for from um, competitive gaming to military applications. Contrast ratio is very important to define sharp details between shades, and that is instrumental for effective diagnosis in, uh, uh, in, in medicine. And I highlight those three because those are exactly the three pillars in which we think this combined flow and acoustics will have the biggest impact in creating new displays. We believe that we can have create a display that has better resolution, fastest, very fast update speed, great contrast ratio with excellent lifetime, affordable and durable. So with that say, I wanna make a quick statements. We're currently doing the iCorps. The, uh, the purpose here is to understand the market and the industry, build our network and collect our data. And in the roadmap, what we are aiming to, to achieve is continue with the NSF iCorps program, collect all our information so that we make a strong case to apply for an SBR grant. With that funding, we will create a minimum viable product and we will finish collecting the preferred information that we, so that we have a strong business model that we can present to our investors in the venture capital and keep growing our company. Lastly, about our team, as Dr. Immersing and I, we provide technical expertise in injury, engineering and applied physics, and also a spirit of leadership, optimism, adaptability, teamwork. Um, we're looking for talented people just like you to join us in this journey and help us give insight in the gaps of knowledge that we have, such as sales, marketing, business development, logistics, and of the like. So if you're interested, please join us in the table. We'll be happy to talk with you and thank you. You bet. Thank you very much. Okay, now we would like to welcome Monica Locke to the stage. She's a cl clinical pharmacist, and she is here to discuss a digital patient-centered medical home platform for the LGBTQIA plus community called Inclusive Health. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. Inclusive Health is a digital patient-centered medical platform for the LGBTQIA plus community. Uh, the team is made up of myself as well as my counterpart, Dahlia. We're both residency trained clinical pharmacists. I oversee the specialty pharmacy department and biotech infusions department at the University of Chicago, and Dahlia is my operations coordinator. Together, we've launched over 18 different service lines. We service over 200 different specialty medications, and I have a team about, of about 40 people that report to me. Uh, this idea came across when one of my pharmacists told, told me that we were servicing a transgender patient, and I realized that we didn't have any part in our case management system that we could potentially document their preferred pronoun. Not only that, but that patient was experiencing a ton of insurance issues getting access to their estrogen hormone replacement therapy which made me realize that we are not properly supporting this patient population and that we can do a better job in um, getting and making sure that they have access to the medications they need. Data shows that, you know, 
25% of uh, people have fear of discrimination or mistreatment when it comes to the potential care that they need. And that also um, some part of the LGBTQIA uh, plus community is concerned that not every pharmacy is going to be able to care for the medication needs that they have. And so um, this is why we're creating inclusive health. We know that we can do a better job than what currently exists out there, and we can do a better job supporting the LB LGBTQIA plus community. With regard to the patient population, we have 1.4 million patients that identify as transgender. With regards to contacts, that's essentially how many uh, people use the Peloton applications. We have 14.6 million adults within the U.S. that identify as LGBTQIA+. Uh, and this number continues to grow. Within the Gen Z population, one in six adults identify within this community. So what we're striving to do is to create a mobile application as well as an online support system that allows for the LGBTQIA patient population to get access to any type of their medication needs. Uh, with regards to services, you know, everyone hates dealing with insurances. So we wanna create an, an insurance concierge service that handles all of the insurance problems that patients may experience as well as their high co-pays. No one likes waiting in lines uh, at the pharmacy to pick up their medication. So we're going to be developing a mail order pharmacy that allows for these medications to be discreetly delivered to the patient's home. Uh, we want to be able to offer different types of um, modalities of talking with the pharmacist. So 24 seven support from a pharmacist via talk or text message, uh, focusing on creating a, a platform uh, to first service smoking and depression anxiety support. The reason why we're uh, focusing on these two is within the LGBTQIA plus community, um, adults within the community are two times more likely to smoke and 2.5 times more likely to experience depression and anxiety. So we want to be able to, um, to put on the platform an, uh, an opportunity for, for them to access a clinician um, if that's something that they want to pursue. We want to work alongside their physical providers, but most importantly, we want to fill their medication, entire medication profile. So if someone has potentially diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, depression, we want to make sure that we're taking care of the entire patient. And the reason for this is something that we're seeing within our current ecosystem. Um, there's a, a ton of TV uh, subscribers that have appeared. Now we have a gazillion different passwords to log into different areas. And so uh, this is happening with, within healthcare where, we're, where you're seeing a lot of platforms focus on specific disease states, whether it's erectile dysfunction, migraine, but, but that's causing a fragmentation in healthcare. And that's not the right way to approach these patients, especially when almost 50% of them have ongoing health conditions or medication problems that require uh, reoccurrent mon monitoring. And so we want to create a one-stop shop for this patient population where we're able to manage all of their medication needs because we want to limit the amount of drug-drug interactions they could potentially experience. Uh, we want to make sure that they have a good understanding of the medications that they're on, as well as um, ensuring that we're able to make sure that these meds are affordable to this, this patient population. So how we differ from our competitors, right? So a lot of things that we're seeing online now, it's disease state focus. What we're focusing on is a specific patient population. So the LGBTQI plus community, we're looking to fulfill the entire medication profile, which is great in that it'll bring a, a, a steady revenue stream to our uh, fulfilling pharmacy. We want to offset financial burden through this uh, insurance concierge service. We want to be able to offer 24 seven support to this community, as well as additional resources with the ability to expand the scope. Our vision is to address all the medication needs for this patient population. Ideally, if we get this right, we would like to become the number one whole patient pharmacy platform, be, being able to service their children, their family members, essentially all of the um, adults in the United States. You know, if, if this vision is of interest to you, uh, we're looking for individuals that uh, would have some expertise in business development, marketing, and technology. We're participating in the iCorps program. For those that are, are online, I've included my email, but um, together we can make inclusive health available and possible for all. Thanks.
Thank you. Uh, our next group is a bimodal group. So we've got somebody in person and somebody presenting virtually, which is kind of exciting. Uh, in person is Dr. Eugene Chang. He's the Martin Boyer Professor of Medicine. He's here in person. And Ryan Chang is an MBA business lead who is here virtually. And they're talking about gateway biome. In addition, Dr. Joseph Pierre and Ashley Sidebottom of the Gateway Biome team will be joining us in person during the post-pitch networking session. Come on up while we work through the logistics. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Gene Chang. I'm a professor in the Department of Medicine. And uh, we're going to do a tag team pre presentation. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Ryan is going to be talking about the business part. I'm going to be talking about the science part. So uh, I think we're still having some technical dif difficulties. Sorry about that. No problem. Okay, um, I guess I'll um, get started. So I'm gonna talk to you about Gateway Biome, which is a venture uh, with the focus of developing diagnostics for the gut microbial organ, otherwise known as the microbiome, that anticipates the future of targeted interventions. I'm not doing too good here, let's see. Let's see, this remote is not working. Am I pointing it in the wrong direction? I hope this isn't cutting into my five minute time period. <laughs> Great. So what is our microbial organ? Well, it's these trillions of microbes that are shown in the lower right half of this uh, picture. They live within us and in close proximity to our own cells. And like most other organ systems, uh, the gut microbiome can exist in states of health as well as disease. In a healthy state, uh, the microbiome confers many essential properties that are important for our well being. In a disease state, however, it can cause or contribute to many human disorders. So, unfortunately, this is covered up, but uh, the point here is unlike most other organ systems, there are no diagnostics available that tell us what a healthy or diseased microbiome is. And as a consequence, we really don't have very good uh, targeted interventions. And so this is the space that uh, Gateway Biome hopes to be in. And we're gonna do this uh, not by looking at all the bacteria that are in our GI tract. Rather, uh, we're gonna look at what they are doing, what they're making. These are metabolites and small molecules because ultimately this is a finite number of molecules that we can actually define. And by doing so, 
the most important thing is that these small molecules are the ones that directly impact us. They're the ones that, for example, control our immune function, but also functions of other organ systems. We can do this because we have high-end instrumentation that can detect over 10,000 signals. Now that's obviously too, much, too many to be a practical application. So we will be using artificial intelligence to define a unique set of, my, uh, of metabolites to create panels that perform well in defining what is a healthy versus a diseased microbiome. Our first goal is to develop a diagnostic panel to define the healthy gut microbiome. Knowing this, we will know what is unhealthy, and we're very close to achieving this. However, in the long run, our goal is to develop a suite of panels that are both indication and disease specific. And by doing so, we can pinpoint abnormalities in the gut microbial organ to which we can develop targeted interventions that are actually effective. So I wanna introduce our team. Uh, as you can see, the team includes many members with different but complementary backgrounds. And at this point, what I'd like to do is turn it over to our business lead, Ryan. Ryan? I guess I'll first ask if you guys can hear me. Yes. Okay, perfect. That's a good start. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So to put it plain, plainly, and Gene, thank you for, for setting that up with some simplifying some very complex topics. Uh, I like to talk about you know, what our technology means to you and to the i -Corps experience. Um, I mean, really big picture, we know that the microbiome is a huge market, 5 billion today and, and in the next five years uh, looking to double, but it remains its infancy. And, and to Gene's point, the fact that we can't even characterize a healthy biome today um, just shows you how you know, much uh, opportunity exists in uh, understanding the lost organ, organ and creating therapeutic outcomes. So when you think about the path forward, and can you go back, uh, back one slide, please? Yeah, when we think about the path forward, we're still early on, and as Gene said at the top there, along our, uh, techno our technology verification, we're still looking for our first IP, and we plan on having that um, in the early fall, probably within the next couple of months and that's to define the healthy biome. In parallel, we understand that, um, that being able to define a healthy biome can also help us define unhealthy biomes and even further more precise disease states. So next slide. As we think about that and how you guys and, and a partnership um, in the i -Corps, um, can help us, it's really solving one, this, this core question um, about what is our best proof of concept given the baseline understanding that we can, we can describe and define a, a healthy biome. And when we think about our best path to proof of concept, we're really thinking about two sides of the house. One is the market side, which is, hey, where's their diagnostic need? Where's there perhaps uh, a pairing with that diagnostic need of some uh, existing therapeutic preventative measures? Right, so a market does exist, but then there's a third component where there's minimal diagnostic solutions today. This might be in some uh, cases, you know, IBS um, or IBD. The other side of the house, we think about what is the path to product commercialization, right? We know that the scarce components we really have as a company um, are time and resources, right? Everybody wants to get to market fast with the least amount of money. Um, and so well, how do you come in and answering those two questions on the path? Um, the low risk path, path and the best market opportunity is really helping us understand the stakeholders. And that's what I highlight at the top here is the insights around the market are gonna come from our ability to deeply understand how insurers and payers, third party certifiers and regulators and patients and clinicians play in this ecosystem that to our, uh, our core, we really want to bring better diagnostic to patients to drastically reduce health, reduce health outcomes. But we know 
only creating a viable and sustainable business uh, in our first proof of concept will get that technology into the right hands. And so as we go forward, it's really, if we can answer that question together and get the first proof of concept, then the next steps, whether that's non-dilutive or investor base or more institutional forms of capital come in, uh, at least we have a, a, a great starting place. So with that, um, I'll turn it back over to you guys. Well, thank you very much. We hope you will join us at our table and uh, hear more about uh, Gateway Bio. Thank you. All right, that concludes our presenters for this evening. And um, just wanna take a moment and offer a round of applause to everybody who took the time to share their ideas with us. Alongside the Polsky team who put this event together, I wanna to thank them all very much too. Shout out to them. Uh, most of all, I wanna thank all of you, whether you're online or you're here in person um, for taking some time to think about the intersection of business and science. Uh, this is an exciting opportunity. If you are in the room, you can join the researchers and faculty members um, at their tables. Don't forget to scan the QR codes if you want to connect with them. And if you are online, you can connect via the connect button on the virtual platform. Uh, at this point, I want to encourage you all just to relax, enjoy yourselves, have some food and drink and get to know each other and our presenters and have a great evening. Thanks so much for coming in.